Hey teachers, welcome to this week's Bite Size PD. Thank you for joining me. So today we're gonna to be talking about developing mathematical proficiency for our elementary teachers, more than just math facts. So quick introduction, I'm Ashley Lennox. I work in the Instructional Supports Department as a teacher specialist. I am in charge of both our elementary math and elementary social studies in ISD. I also support information literacy. I am, if you're a fifth grade teacher, you get a weekly email from me. And like many of us, I also have my other duties as assigned. So professional learning norms for today, really what I hope is that you're gonna give what you can and take what you need. At the end of this, if you feel like there's something that I missed or if there's any feedback that you would like to give from me, please, please, please do. That's why I like to put my email on there, that ashley.lennox at canyonsdistrict.org. And because this is a weekly optional series, I hope that you're here to get something very specific for your classroom. I'm hoping to give you some resources that you can implement starting tomorrow with your students in mathematics, as well as build some of that content knowledge for you as well. So looking at our MTSS framework, really what we're going to be living in today is the blue section of standards for instruction. So why do we teach what we teach and how do we teach it? Going to our learning intentions and success criteria, today I hope that you're able to build some content knowledge of mathematical proficiency to identify how to best support students in mathematical knowledge. And you'll know that you're successful when you can describe the strands of mathematical proficiency to a member of your team, your coach, your principal, um, random person at the grocery store. I hope that we can build this into our regular language. Here's just a quick look at our agenda. So I wanted to start with something, again, that you could easily implement into your classroom tomorrow. This is very much a K2 kind of subitizing example, but we can talk about how to scaffold that up. So really what I did here was I went on to the noun project. I picked an image that your students might be learning about in the science curriculum, so patterns of weather, and then asking this question, are there more sunny days or snowy days? And then being able to explain your reasoning. So what I'm thinking is that if I'm in an upper grade, if I'm in grades three, four, five, a way that you could adapt the same activity is put fractions up there. You could put some decimals up there, but just some type of way for students to be able to look at something, make a decision. And most important down at the bottom there is that explaining your reasoning. Can they take their kind of final answer, if you will, and then be able to explain it with a partner? And that brings in that standards of mathematical practice and also what we're going to see on our rope today. As a quick bridge, I wanted to make sure that we continue to remind ourselves that our goal in mathematics for our early learning is that by the end of this school year, 23-24, we will increase the percentage of first grade students who are scoring at or above benchmark at the early math skill of or advanced quantity discrimination through Acadians at AQD by 4% from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. So, and there are some ways that we can do that through our um, evidence-based instruction, coaching supports to our first grade teachers, and then making sure that we give our students that strong foundation in math discrimination skills. So if you are a kindergarten teacher or a second through fifth grade teacher, that's something that might seem a little bit abstract to you. If you've been to my PDs in the past, you know that um, you, you have heard that this is something that we chose this measure because of that predictability piece of how students are able to perform on later math benchmark assessments and really just how they interact with math as a whole. So that's why we chose this one. Um, I encourage you to look at your mid-year data. There are quite a few of you that have a lot to celebrate. So I hope that you are doing so both with yourself, your teams and your students. So thank you for all of the hard work that you do for students in mathematics. So let's jump into it. Our strands of mathematical proficiency. So this was something that I, I'm gonna be honest, I stumbled upon it by accident through some research that I was doing a couple years ago for um, a different purpose. And I was really excited because I thought, oh my gosh, um, we came up with one for math. There's Scarborough's Rope and Reading, which any of you that have done letters, you're very well familiar with at this point. Um, so I was really excited that recently in my mind that this rope had been developed. And then when I looked at the bottom of the footnote and it had when it was actually published, and it said 2001, I became really discouraged because 
Um, you know, at this point, it's been around for a while, and why am I just now hearing about it? So I wanted to make sure that, uh, that really the purpose of this is to pay it forward, to make sure this is something that we're all thinking about as we develop our math lessons. So the strands of mathematical proficiency, like I said, were published in 2001 by the National Council for Teachers of Mathematics, and it was meant to be a complement to Scarborough's Rope. So we have Scarborough's Rope in reading, which came out in the late 1990s, and then this came out just a couple years after to support in math. Um, to be honest, I don't know why it hasn't gained the momentum that Scarborough's Rope has, but um, maybe we can start that momentum here in Canyon School District. So pretty exciting stuff. But the five strands of the rope, we're gonna go into each one of these in depth, and I'm gonna read from left to right and kind of go over, starting with adaptive reasoning, strategic competence, conceptual understanding, productive disposition, and procedural fluency. We're gonna go into these in a little bit of a different order, and um, You'll see why in just a moment. I kind of tried to prioritize where we see them most often within our curriculum. So that way you could kind of build them in in that way that made a little bit more sense, if you will. So we're going to start with conceptual understanding. So this refers to the integrated and functional grasp of mathematical ideas. So it's really what does the math mean, right? So it's less about being able to get the answer right, but do you understand what you're being asked? So this enables students to learn new ideas by connecting the ideas to what they already know. The benefits of building this conceptual understanding include the retention and the prevention of common errors. So that's something when students have that strong conceptual understanding, they can really identify whether or not their answer is reasonable because they know what it is that they're being asked. So if I know, and I'm going to do a very basic example, and I'm doing it on the fly, so wish me luck. If I know that I have a certain number of apples and I get more apples, my answer should be bigger than either one of those two numbers. That's conceptual understanding. And when they have something to anchor their learning in, they're able to retain that information for a longer period of time. This is also why within Envision, we don't start with the algorithm in terms of the instruction of a concept with students. We start with kind of the why and how of all of these things working together, and then we move into the algorithm. So we're going to jump into some of these examples, but it's modeling. This is something that often comes up is why is there so much modeling in Envision? This is why is because it's going to support those big picture ideas. Vocabulary is huge in conceptual understanding. If I don't know what the words mean, I really can't solve the answer, right? And then concept mapping. This is something that is um, not emphasized as much within Envision, but I'm going to show you some places where you can pull that in pretty easily. So here's what that modeling in math looks like. These are all examples that you've probably seen within your teacher edition. On the right-hand side with the base 10 blocks and the unifix cubes, those are screenshots directly from your curriculum from various grade levels. On the left-hand side was something that I wanted to show to you as a way that you can use this with your students. So I can write a number with numbers. So how would I write it as a fraction and a decimal? The drawing a picture, that's the modeling part of it using our words and then modeling it in a real world connection, right? So in this case, the student chose to do dimes or coins in order to show that what one dime equals one tenth of a dollar. So I, I'm really going to encourage you, this is where those manipulatives are so important. I see a number of you that have things like your 10 frames that are on your board to use. So um, please don't skip this part because that is where that conceptual understanding is truly built. Next is the vocabulary. So we have the systematic vocabulary routine in math that's found in your curriculum map. I just did a quick screenshot of it for a small piece that you can use. Also within Envision, you have the vocabulary cards that you can use in your instruction. That's on the left with the My Word cards. And on the right is the vocabulary activity. So at the beginning of each topic, there's a vocabulary activity that you can use with your students or adapt to make it a little bit more meaningful if you feel like you need to do that as well. So this one is teaching tool 25. That's going to be the same K-5 where in the center, the students would write the words. They provide a student friendly definition. What does it look like? What does it not look like? And then some characteristics. Next is concept mapping. Concept mapping is very similar to our learning progressions, and I'll share some really great resources with you a little bit later on. This is a kindergarten example. So when we say number sense in kindergarten, this is really what that means. So as, as a teacher team, you would be breaking these down in terms of 
when we say number sense, do we all, are we all on the same page in terms of what number sense actually means? And this is a really fun activity that you can do within a PLC. I'm, I would have, I would love to come out and do this with you because it's really fun to think about how it is that students interact with these different math concepts throughout the day, not just in math. So you can see on this example um, when it says the kids lining up, right? So that's an example of how we're doing that all day, every day. Let's just add that math um, vocabulary and language into it. And then we're building that conceptual understanding throughout the day in, in a couple seconds or less. So let's move on to our next strand of the rope. And this is procedural fluency. And I'm going to speak for myself that I feel like procedural fluency as a classroom teacher is something that is, it, it feels almost debilitating to our students. And it's very difficult to overcome if there's a deficit in procedural fluency. So the purpose for this is really let's make sure that we all have a shared understanding of what procedural fluency is. So that way we can, um, we can make sure that we're supporting our students in it. So the way that it is defined in the strands of mathematical proficiency is it's the skill in carrying out procedures flexibly, accurately, efficiently, and appropriately. So this is something that means that there's more than one way that we can solve four times three, for example, and having a plan of how we want students to be able to do that is really the key of procedural fluency. So some examples of that, again, are number sense. This is something that I think um, many of you have started implementing in your classrooms. It's outlined in our math block. And the, the biggest tool that I can recommend for doing this is that Building Fact Fluency Kit. So this is where a lesson string contains all of those great elements to build that number sense over the course of a week or so, okay? So um, that, that's kind of a, a big one for me. We do still have funding for teachers in Kenya School District to get one of these kits for free if you would like to. I'll share that link with you later on in the presentation. So, and on the bottom right-hand side, that's just kind of a picture of what it entails. Also, don't shy away from having your students explain their reasoning. If they come up with an answer, even, right, wrong, way off, bait, whatever it is, have students take that extra few minutes to explain what they meant and what their reasoning is behind that answer. Um, and I just want to do one quick reminder on here that if we're going to do true procedural fluency instruction is not just assessing fluency. And that is one of the reasons why we moved away from reflex math a couple of years ago before I, I took on this role is because our outcomes from it just weren't giving us what we needed. And when we kind of dug in, we realized that it was doing a great job of assessing fluency for our students, but it wasn't instructing students on what that fluency truly meant. If they went into the day not knowing what six times six was, they typically didn't leave knowing what it was either because we didn't have that concrete number sense development. Um, and then also just thinking about different strategies, right? So let's teach students to, to identify what they know and then be able to work forwards from that. So our next strand here is strategic competence. So this is the ability to formulate, represent, and solve mathematical problems. So this is really where word problems come into play because if we've spent all of our time over here on this procedural fluency piece and we don't ever get to this idea of how do we build that strategy element of math, then our students are really going to struggle, struggle in those word problems because that's where that's going to come into play pretty heavily. So on here, a couple of things to consider when you're doing this are number one, discourse. Always have our students talking. So on the bottom here, you can see a bar graph. That's an example of a teacher that was using that TeachFX software to identify what was teacher talk time versus student group and silent talk time. So, and with math discourse, in order for it to be most effective, give them something meaningful to talk about. Um, you know, if it's a turn and talk, tell your partner what two plus two is, can we offer something else that they can do in addition as well to build that strategic competence? Also, we have the close reading in math routine or the three reads in math routine, depending on what research you're looking at. So in the middle there in that green box, you can see what the student sentence scaffold frames to scaffold the discussion can look like. This is also found within the curriculum map or the instructional guides. And what this does is it breaks it down where students are reading the problem multiple times with a different purpose each time, similar to our close reading in Wondered or in the ELA block. So 
the first one, I think that this is most important, is that students are retelling the problem without using the numbers. Um, I was at a professional professional learning opportunity at one of our elementary schools, and the coach did a great job of this, where she said, okay, the students are going on a field trip, and some students are going to be going on this bus, and some students are going on this bus. How many students are going to be going into each bus? So very basic, so the students have the context of what the problem's asking, and then they're able to go into the math part of it. And then also the teacher questioning strategies. This is a link to a document from pbs.org of how you can ask questions in mathematics to support that strategic competence. Now, um, when we're asking those questions that are, are more complex, one area that you can almost always be guaranteed to find a problem that requires strategic competence is each lesson in Envision has a higher order thinking question associated with it. I would recommend that this is something that every day in your instruction you're doing with your students to make sure that they have access to this. This also supports making sure that we're giving students more DOK 2 and 3 questions in their math. So here are two examples, again, just screenshots. The first one is to write and solve an addition story problem. This is a first grade example. So within this, basically what they're doing is they're writing a word problem for themselves. So they're building in that relevance. Okay, the second one, I believe this is fourth grade. So what they they know that a football team needs to sell a certain number of tickets. They sell this many tickets to one game, this many tickets to another. Estimate, did they sell enough tickets? Okay, and then be able to explain. Never let your students get out of explaining their answer. Um, even if it's just oral to you, if they're just giving you a verbal um justification that's okay if you feel like the time part can be limiting there um, or if there's a, another barrier in place but never let them off the hook without explaining their answer with, to develop that strategic competence with these types of problems so moving to our next strand is the adaptive reasoning this one is huge because this is how you um, how you think through these things right so it's the capacity for logical thought reflection, explanation, and justification. So really thinking through the math as, as a whole, and it's this big picture piece. What's really neat is that when students have the opportunity to really build in that adaptive reasoning, what you'll start to see is they start to make connections between these various contents that you're teaching in math or the various strands that you're teaching in math, and they're doing it without you having to guide them. So we're developing a little bit more um, learner focused, if you will, as far as the connections that they see. So when you get to the upper grades, you're going to see students that start to see the relationship between fractions and decimals without you having to um, emphasize it too heavily. They start to make those connections on their own because they have that adaptive reasoning piece. So some of the examples of that are the convince me. Um, anytime you can have students prove their thinking, again, this is in every one of our Envision lessons as well. Reflection on a problem solving. This is another chart that you can use. I'm just going to pull it up so you can kind of see what it looks like. And what it does is it gives you the opportunity. It's kind of like a little mini rubric that you can use and adapt on how, how do you solve problems in math. You also have questioning strategies and then student generated answer charts. So here's some examples. So um, the convince me within the math itself. You also have teaching tool number one is the problem solving recording sheet. This takes a larger problem and breaks it down into all of these different areas to develop that, that adaptive reasoning. On the top right is that student generated anchor chart. This is one where the students were solving a problem using multiple strategies. So they made a poster to show multiple strategies. So again, they can make that with one problem and now you stick it on the wall. And it's something that every student can then use. And then on the bottom right is another example that you'll see within Envision, and that's that reasoning. They're, they're just called the reasoning problem. So I believe this one's a first grade example. So with this, they're having to break it down into where do I start, how many more am I adding, and then what does my equation actually look like? And finally, our last one. This one is so, so, so important. They're all important, but this is really how you feel about math. All right, so this is how students see themselves as mathematicians in your classroom. So this idea of productive disposition is the inclination to see mathematics as sensible, useful, and worthwhile. 
coupled with a belief in diligence and the student's own efficacy. So um, the soapbox that I will get on often is that math feels like the only content area that we're allowed to brag about being bad at. Um, and let's start changing that narrative, right? So by building that productive disposition, we're changing that narrative for our students. So this really is how we talk about math in our classroom. So just be careful about the words that you use and the messages that you send about mathematics and your own experiences with it. Um, so some examples of how you can build that into your classroom. Number one, have your students write a math autobiography and you can share your own as well. How do they see themselves as mathematicians? This is a great activity to do with students those first couple days at the beginning of the school year when you're trying to really figure out who's in your classroom and um, and how they feel about these different content areas. So there's tons and tons and tons of templates out there that are free to write a math autobiography depending on the grade level that you teach. Um, but and then again, just make sure that you are very positive about the math that you, uh, the way that you talk about math in your classroom. OK, um, next content integration. This is huge. If we can help students identify where math is present in all of these other content areas, it's everywhere. So really pointing that out to students is a great way to build that productive disposition as well, because they start to see themselves as mathematicians because they can do math in these other arenas as well. Disciplinary literacy, this is an element that's been in the, the instructional guides as well over the last couple of years. And this is the idea that how how is literacy impacting our math understanding and how is our math knowledge impacting our literacy understanding? So that's how that's broken down within the maps. You also have math tasks. This is something that with every other unit in Envision or every other topic in Envision has a 3F math task. Those are also in the Building Fact Fluency kits. And then I also wanted to show you this one, and this is the idea of rigor with a purpose. So how can we not only add more rigor into our math instruction, but how can we do it in a way that that is relevant and kind of fun for kids? So this is a free printable, um, you know, share a real life event with the class, tell the story and give all the necessary information to solve the problem. So students should solve it by drawing a picture and explain their strategy with words and numbers. And it's broken down similar to that problem solving sheet that we see as teaching tool one in Envision, but having students really think about how does math impact me, okay? Last, I wanted to go through some more resources for you. We went through quite a few. Um, some of those are on this page and then others are just ones that you can do in addition to. So the first one is that Building Fact Fluency Kit. That link brings you to the Canvas page where you can sign up. Make sure that you complete those first two modules in order for the kit to be sent to you. If you've done that and you still haven't gotten your kit over within a week, reach out to me directly and or have your coach reach out to me and we'll make sure that we get you one pretty soon afterwards. The next one, I'm just going to go through. Uh, I'm going to click on each one of these so you can see them. This one is Robert Kaplinski. Robert Kaplinski is a mathematician who is really good about um, sharing out strategies, resources, et cetera, and almost everything on his page is free. What I like about these is there are some great DOK pieces on here. Uh, these open middle problems are really fun because there's not a, a right or wrong answer as long as students can justify their reasoning. Now, one thing that I would highly encourage you to do is if this is something that you're going to use in your classroom, always have students add the justification piece to it. So what you can see here is just looking at our NBT one standard in first grade. You can see the task that they're asked to do, have them justify it. Um, that's the way that we can always make sure that we're building onto more than one strand of that math rope at once. So that's Robert Kaplinski. He has some really great resources on there. The next one is our learning progressions. Learning progressions, this brings you to achievethecore.org. And what you can see on here is how each one of those strands in mathematics is broken down by the progression itself. OK, so where have they been? Where are they going? Next, we have our learning trajectories. This is one that is for our pre-K up to grade three. If you're a fourth or fifth grade teacher, though, I would highly encourage you to look at it because there are still some really great things on here. 
It is free to sign up. They don't send you anything. They're not going to fill up your, your email box unless they do have something kind of truly new. Um, I can count on one hand how many times I've gotten something from them. But what you do on this one is you go to your learning trajectories here. You look at what it is maybe that your students are going to be doing coming up. And you can see all the different ways that they can actually prove that, starting with that comparison sensor with the foundations all the way down to the composition estimator, OK? So that's learning trajectories. That's a really great one. These next ones are kind of fun ones that you can do as warm up. So similar to what we did at the beginning of this, where I had you look at the image and subitize which one is greater and justify. There's would you rather math and then which one doesn't belong. So would you rather math gives students uh, two options and they pick through math which one they'd rather do. So very basic example could be something like would you rather collect one dollar a day until you're 18 or would you rather get a hundred dollars a year for the rest of your life. OK, um, so that's that would you rather piece. The next one is which one doesn't belong in this one. There is no right or wrong answer on this. What the students do is they're given four options and they decide which one doesn't belong. So you can see the examples here. Elementary, I would live over here in the shapes and numbers, maybe more so than the graphs and equations. But what you can see is that students can look on here and they can go, OK, I think this one doesn't belong because it doesn't have three sides or this one doesn't belong because it's grayed out and the rest are white or this one doesn't belong because it points down. So it's really building that justification of reasoning there. OK, so number odd or even. Um, yeah, so those ones are pretty fun. The next one, these are some resources from Karen Hess. So there is a learning progressions document there. There is a framework for how to use the learning progressions, a rigor matrix. I did the link to all the content areas that she has up to this point in case she wanted to use this in another content area as well. Um, but the math one is on there. I believe it's form two. And then lastly, a DOK task analysis. Sometimes with DOK, it's like we say it's a two, but we, we can't always prove that it's a two. So this is one way that you can use that is as a team, um, use a checklist. How do they differ, right? So you have your depth of understanding here, how it's broken down this way, and then how it goes into each one of these elements um, of mathematics, OK? So oftentimes what we find is that there's only one correct answer. It's oftentimes going to be a DOK one or two. So this just breaks it down for you. So that is what I have for you today. So I hope that what you'll do is as you try some of these things out, you'll reach out to me. Let me know how it went. Um, please give me feedback. And I hope that you have a great week, month, rest of the year. We're in March, so we've done it. Thank you so much for coming.